Today, we are going to paddle and we're going to take you on paddling adventures in Northeast Ohio and beyond. So again, I am Rachel with Cleveland Metro Parks Outdoor Recreation and I absolutely love to paddle. Behind the screen is going to be Ashley Rossetti. She is a phenomenal paddler as well. And this summer we had the opportunity to go and have some fun paddling adventures on the Lake Erie Water Trail, the Cuyahoga River, Cuyahoga River Water Trail, and the Allegheny River Water Trail. So as you're looking at these pictures, as you're looking at these words, go ahead and put in the chat, choosing everyone, uh, what do all of these trails have in common? Uh, so go ahead and start putting those down so we can see what they have in common. As you do that, I'm gonna give you a little bit more background. All right, so a little more background. So again, I'm Rachel and I love to stand up paddleboard and all of these pictures I'm on a stand up paddleboard. I'm going to deliver the first part of the presentation about the Lake Erie water trail. Ashley again behind the computer is a huge kayaker and she's going to talk about our overnight paddling camping adventure on the Allegheny River water trail. So we both kayak. We both stand up paddleboard. My passion stand up paddleboarding. Hers is kayaking. Um, but we're going to tell you about all kinds of fun adventures while we are out here. All right. So I see a couple things. Uh, water. Yes. So water is going to be a big thing that they all have in common. And I'm going to take that one step further. They are all water trails. So what exactly is this thing that we call a water trail that all of these are part of? So a water trail, and you're going to see this here on the next slide in just a second, the water trail is going to be a trail that is on water. So just like you go hiking, just like you go biking, those are trails and they have to be made with either some type of asphalt or dirt. And we call those greenways because there's greenery, there's grass, there's trees all along the way. Well, on a water trail, you don't have to make the trail. It's already there. It's the water. So we call those the blue ways. And because you don't have to make the trail, the water's there, you have to do something else. You have to create public access points because there's private property, these, all these things. So you have to create the access points that people can come through and then let people know where those access points are. Safety information, brochures, maps. When you do all of that, you can apply for state designation for a water trail. In Ohio, that's going to be through the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. And behind me, you can see a map here of all the different water trails in Ohio. And Cuyahoga River water trail that we'll talk about a little bit was designated in 2019. And we're hoping the Lake Erie water trail will get designated here in 2021. So I'm going to take you on the adventures of the Lake Erie water trail. So the Lake Erie Water Trail goes above the northern coast, I'm going to call it the north coast, of Cleveland. Um, so here's a great picture of downtown there, uh, but it goes along the northern coast and it goes from the west, Huntington Beach, all the way to the east to Sims Park. It spans 20, mi 20 plus miles long, depending on where you go. So we are working with a lot of partners to be able to designate this as a water trail. So we're going to dive into those maps that we looked at, uh, that we talked about, that we're creating as part of a water trail. And I know it's really hard to see here, but don't worry, when this trail is designated, we have a really cool brochure that's going to be coming out and you'll see bits and pieces, but this has all of the maps that we're going to show you. They'll be available later this summer, but from the west, you can get started at Huntington Beach and then you can continue to go downtown. If you go from left to right on the pictures below, that's Huntington Beach then the entrance of Rocky River, and then the last one is actually surfing at Edgewater. And I don't know if you know this, but there's a huge surf culture in Cleveland, which is really, really cool. Uh, so we'll continue to go through this map as we continue to go east to Sims Park. Behind me, you can see the bottom left picture is going to be the freighter. So that's Wendy Park area, and then North Coast Harbor. The great thing you can see here is it's kind of red in the uh, left part of it, and that has the break wall. Great thing about the break wall is it provides protection from the wind and the waves coming, but there's also a lot of freighter traffic. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about what that means. So now that you've seen the Lake Erie water trail, um, what I'm going to do is I got this 
fun, we'll call it a really fun idea, this summer. Uh, fortunately, Ashley and I had some more time, and so we tried some things we'd wanted to do. We'd wanted to paddle the Lake Erie Water Trail, do a, a touring overnight trip. Uh, so we took advantage of that. Previously, I'd done around 10 miles, went from Huntington Beach to Wendy Park. But I decided this year I wanted to paddle the entire Lake Erie Water Trail. Spoiler alert if you can read that, I went 27.81 miles, so I did complete it in one day. But that wasn't necessarily my goal. My goal was to start it, see how I felt, and if I felt good enough, then I'd continue on. And you can see the map, the route that I took, it just goes straight along that coastline. So what I'm gonna to do today is not only take you on my adventure, but tell you some tips to create your own micro adventures close to home here in Northeast Ohio. All right, so what does this trip look like? I decided to start on the west side in Huntington Beach. Um, main reason, you check the weather conditions. If you're paddling all day, literally 11 hours, you want to make sure the wind is in your favor. So this was a south wind, which meant we had glassy flat water just like it is here. You do not see that very often on Lake Erie, so this was a good day. Uh, and then I knew later in the day the wind was going to shift to the west and I wanted to, to help me and not hurt me. So I started at Huntington Beach. Behind me here you can see the sign. There's a place you can drop off your kayak or your stand-up paddle board. When you go ahead and drop it off, um, you do have to leave it and park your car up a little bit uh, further away. So I just brought a lock that I used to block my board onto my rack, tied it to a tree, took my uh, vehicle away, and then got on the water. And you can see there's towering cliff lines here. That is going to be the west side paddling of the Lake Erie Water Trail. Tall, towering cliffs um, that we'll talk about here in just a little bit more. As I continue to be able to paddle, uh, from Huntington Beach, the next place I'm going to see is going to be Brad Street Landing. So as I continue to Brad Street Landing, this is the view that I see. It's completely flat, and I don't know if you can see it, but if you look really hard, and I'm not going to be able to point to it right there, there it is, right there, yes, right above my finger, that is the Cleveland skyline. So 10, 12 miles away, you can start to see it. And we're going to inch closer to that Cleveland skyline and then go further away. So we're gonna monitor that as we go. But lots of people out here paddling. As I continue to go, I do get to Brad Street's Landing. And as you're paddling, things look so small because the Lake Erie is so vast. So you have to look for small things, something we call a boater's eye. So I was looking for that pier. And when I saw the pier, I knew I'd made it to Brad Street Landing. And the cool thing is that's a place you can get out, take a break. If you wanna have your own micro adventure, you could go from Huntington Beach to Brad Street, Brad Street to Rocky River. There's so many places that you can have your own adventure. Just make sure you, of course, check the weather, the wind, the waves, the water before you go out and paddle. Behind me, you can see a cool picture. So swallow bird nest just under the pier. So as you're paddling, you can kind of look up, see all the birds flying around, and it's a cool way to be able to connect to nature while you continue to paddle. As you continue to paddle uh, towards the east, the next place I came to was Rocky River. Uh, so this is where Lake Erie Water Trail meets the Rocky River. Something to keep in mind is they do have the towering cliffs right here at the entrance. So you have to be careful when you're crossing this channel. Anytime you cross a channel, you want to take it straight at a 90 degree angle. That 90 degree angle is going to let you get across the channel where other boat traffic is as fast as you can. And then the other thing is this is a super, super flat day. That's the way I planned it and the way I liked it. But even on a flat day, you can see in this bottom picture, when boaters go through, they're going to cause waves. And what happens because you have that towering cliff line is those waves are gonna come up, they have no place to dissipate, and they're gonna come back. So you're gonna see later as the wind picks up, as boat traffic picks up, you can get some pretty big waves even on a really calm day on the lake. As you continue around Rocky River, you can see that towering cliff line. You can also see if we go up this channel, it's the Rocky River, and about a mile you're gonna hit the Emerald Necklace Marina. For a short micro adventure, you can put in at the Emerald Necklace Marina. There's rentals there in the summer. Paddle out to the lake. If the lake looks flat like this, go ahead and enjoy it. If it's not, uh, go ahead and turn around and you have a nice little trip there. The other thing to keep in mind, not just the towering cliff walls, but you also have some private property. So over here, you're gonna see a nice sandy beach. However, that's private property. Uh, so you have to be aware of all those public access points as you continue to be able to paddle. 
All right, as we continue to go uh, to the east a little bit further, we're going to come to Lakewood Park, the Solstice Steps. Really cool view to be able to have while you are out there enjoying your paddle. Um, but, I know it's hard to see, but these are concrete pillars. Um, so they are there to help with erosion, but they are not a place that you can get out. So don't plan to get out and take a rest here. Know that you're gonna have to go a little bit further to Perkins to be able to do that. You can also see our Cleveland skyline is getting much, much closer. And when you're paddling all day, it is so awesome to really be able to see that skyline get closer because like, yes, I've been paddling and I'm getting closer. I still have a long way to go, but life is good. All right, as we continue to head east, uh, we come to Perkins Beach. So this took me a little over three hours, about 10 miles. So on a stand-up paddleboard, you're probably going, if you're going um, consistently, two and a half to three and a half miles per hour. Uh, so Perkins is a great place to be able to stop and have lunch. Maybe paddle from Wendy Park or Edgewater, stop, have lunch here, paddle back. Might not recommend starting here because in that upper left corner, you are going to see that, that is a steep stair. So where that circle is, that's where my boat is. So it's a big carry down uh, for your board or your kayak. It can be done, uh, but maybe easier to and closer to the water at Wendy Park or Edgewater. But Perkins is a beautiful place to be able to go. As we continue on from here, we have Edgewater. And the Edgewater, the Cleveland skyline is so close. We've made it, right? Uh, so it's a great feeling. But the interesting thing about getting to Edgewater is it was about 11, 12 o'clock. And you can see that that is not flat water anymore. Uh, the waves are starting to churn up. So even though you think it's going to be a flat day, midday you're still going to get some waves. So you have to be comfortable on your board or your kayak uh, because you are in an open water condition. And we're going to show you some of the equipment that you need to bring with you in an open water environment. And you can see just how much the weather can change it. Uh, down here, so that's someone who's out surfing. And when you're out there surfing, um, obviously you want big waves, but if you're going out for the first time, that is not a condition that you are going to want. All right, as we continue to go, we're going to come to Wendy Park or the historic Coast Guard Station. Um, so the unique thing about Wendy Park is that you have now crossed two water trails. We are on the Lake Erie Water Trail, and coming out at the Coast Guard Station is the Cuyahoga River Water Trail. So about 12.5 miles in, and the best part about Wendy Park is not only that you have two trails coming together, but you have a paddler's paradise. So in the next picture here, you're going to see that paddler's paradise, and that is because there are so many people who can get out and enjoy the water at the same time. You can see me as a paddler's here, someone's windsurfing, there's freighters, there's power boaters, everybody can enjoy this. So it's great to see so many people out recreating. The downfall is going to be that you have to be careful. You have to learn what's called the rules of the road. So if anybody's heard of the rules of the road, um, it's who gives way. And you always, anybody has to give way to a freighter uh, because the commercial traffic. So there are lots of freighters, lots of boats coming through today. And so in the next picture, you're going to see what the windsurfer decided to do. Lots of freighters are there. It's best just to come in, wait, let them pass. When it clears, then you can go back out. And the reason is because freighters can be somewhat dangerous. In the next slide, we're going to show you what that looks like. So a freighter has something known as a thruster. So this paddler here, uh, happens to be Ashley's husband. He is by a thruster and you might be going, what is he doing? It's okay. That one is a friendly freighter because that is the, uh, the Mather down by the Great Lakes Science Center. And so that one is always docked there. So if you want to get an up close look at a freighter, you can look there. The other ones move around and that's when you run into trouble. So this thruster is what allows a freighter to be able to turn. It has to turn based on current and wind. And so when it turns, it not only creates this big propulsion, but it creates air bubbles that can help, that can actually suck a boater towards it. It can be very dangerous. So to be a smart paddler, we recommend that you check AIS systems, such as marinetraffic.com, and you can see what the app looks like right here. So the app is going to have a map of the river, and then it has a diamond. If you click on that, you can actually see how big that is. If it's a big freighter, you want to make sure that you get out of the way. All right, so as we continue to talk about freighters, 
um, the thruster that I had talked about. Here is the symbol for the, the freighter. So right here, that big white mark is the, uh, the thruster symbol. It's located just below that. It's on the bow and the stern. And then that's the churn that it creates. So if you're in there paddling, it feels like a washing machine. And it can make it hard to stay upright, which is why they're so dangerous. And you can see the size comparison here. We have the freighter, there's a power motor, as well as a paddler. A freighter is 50 times, let me say that again, 50 times bigger than a stand-up paddleboarder. So you want to make sure that you always give way. Again, the Mather is up here. That's the only one that you can get close to while you're paddling in the area. All right, so freighters, as we continue, we're going to get a close look of a freighter on the river. So this is the Cuyahoga River Water Trail that we talked about a little bit ago. And so when they go in here, it gets tight because if you've ever paddled on the river, um, it can be tight. And if you paddle, go ahead and tell us some stories that you've had on the Cuyahoga River, maybe different sections you paddled. Ashley's going to talk about the Cuyahoga River a little bit later as well. Uh, but as you're paddling on the Cuyahoga River, it can get pretty tight as it's turning in there. So we want to make sure paddlers are well prepared. And the cool thing is we have American Courage here. You can also see Terminal Tower. So Terminal Tower, if you take it on its side, turn it down and float it down this river, that's the size of the freighters, which can be pretty intimidating. So on the next slide, we're going to give you some tips to be able to prepare yourself if you decide to paddle. Rivergate Park, Merwin's Wharf, is a great place to be able to put in as long as you're well prepared for it. We just put a sculpture down there, uh, thanks to a grant from REI to be able to put it there. And it basically helps to educate you as paddlers that freighters are huge and how should you interact with them. And there's safety signage that's down there as well. So if you're not sure, are you prepared to paddle on the river? Are you prepared to paddle on the lake? This is safety signage will be able to help you out. You can expect to see this safety signage along the Lake Erie Water Trail coming up as well. Next, we're going to be able to see a closer view of the map. So this is the, the shipping channel, and if you know a freighter is coming, you want to make sure you get out of the way. So how do you know a freighter's coming? First, carry that VHF radio. The VHF radio here is a handheld radio, and you can hear when a freighter's coming up and down the river. You can also use, you can also use the uh, your phone to be able to use an app. MarineTraffic.com is a great app to be able to use and you can pull up and see if one's coming. Using those two devices, if you know there's a freighter, our best piece of advice is get off the river. Let them pass. They're huge and they never know when they have to use those thrusters. If you can't get off the river, you can look at the map behind me and you can get to one of the passing zones. Again, this map and the sign is at Merwin's Wharf when you put on. And the big thing is never stay in the middle of the river when a freighter's coming. Get to the side and prepare yourself. All right, so we've talked about the safety of the river. We've talked about the freighters. So we are come, we came out of the Cuyahoga River, and this was another trip that Ashley and I decided to paddle out into the middle of Lake Erie. I want you to guess what the heck are we paddling to and why this interesting shape on Strava. Uh, so go ahead and take, take the guess of where we paddled out to and where we came back and why that shape. Why not go out and come back if there was something out there to be able to see. Put your guesses in the chat. As you do, I'm just going to do a quick refresh of what we have going on here. So we started on the west, we passed Rocky River, came through the Cuyahoga River, and then over to the Emerald Necklace. So I see Ashley nodding her head, so I'm getting the feeling that you guys are super, super smart out there. Um, so if I take a step closer, I can see to the crib. I'll give you a hint. It's not Canada. Yeah, we want to paddle to Canada, but right now, we're not allowed in Canada. So we only paddle to the crib, and I see on there the five-mile crib. So the interesting thing about this, and nice job, air high five to everybody who got that right, uh, but the cool thing with the crib is it's called the five mile crib. Does that mean we paddled five miles out and five miles back? That would make sense, right? Well, the interesting thing is it's called the five mile crib because the crib or the water intake, so anytime you drink water in the city of Cleveland, that's where your water comes from. Um, so the five mile crib is known that because the piping to the Kirtland pump station where they treat your water is 
through piping that is five miles long. It was created at the beginning of the 19th century. They had some rehab in 1990s on it. Um, but your water comes from there and it's five miles to get there. From shore though, it's only three, three and a half. Uh, so if you can paddle out there in around seven miles or something like that. So the interesting shape is we were paddling back in and if you're familiar with the area, the break wall has a split in it and there's two lighthouses. And we talked about that being huge freighter traffic area. Well, there was a freighter that was coming out that day. So instead of risking getting close to a freighter, we decided to paddle to the outside of the break wall, come around and loop back around, hence the shape. So you can see here some pictures of the crib if you haven't had the chance to be able to paddle out there. It is this huge structure. Um, if you paddle out there, of course, make sure you have some skills. There is no place that you can get off uh, to be able to do it. It's something we've been wanting to do for a while, practiced our skills to be able to get them up. Choose a south wind day. North winds are going to create bigger waves here. Uh, so south wind day, even though it's harder to paddle back, it's going to make less waves and make it easier. The other interesting thing about the crib is when you get there, you're going to hear this continuing noise. Um, it's an air horn. So the air horn will continue to be able to go off uh, so that boaters and freighters who are paddling out there, of course, aren't going to run into it. All right, so as we continue, we're going to get back on that Lake Erie Water Trail. We took a, a little diversion to the Cuyahoga River as well as, uh, as the crib, but back on the water trail. I have a great question. Sure. You're asking what app we're using to track your paddle trail. Yeah, so I was using Strava. Um, it's just super simple, and they've actually added a paddle one, so you can choose stand-up paddle boarding, which is kind of cool. In the past, you had to use running or something, but they have it where you can go ahead and just track it. Uh, it, does, it does drain your battery a little bit, so I'll admit that I had to recharge uh, my, my battery at lunch, which you'll see where I stopped at lunch here at East 55th, but great question, definitely. All right, so if you guys have other questions, go ahead, feel free to, to bounce them in. We would love to be able to help you to plan your adventures as well. So this view is, of course, the Cleveland skyline. And out on the Cleveland skyline, this is the reason that I and I find many people decide to live, work, and play in Cleveland. Anytime we lead trips out here, everyone has to stop and marvel at this beautiful skyline of Key Tower, of Terminal Tower. It's just so beautiful when you're paddling. So if you haven't had the chance to get out there and paddle, definitely check it out. All right, as we go past that Cleveland skyline, we finally reach it. Now we're gonna go away from it. We hit Burke Airport. Something to keep in mind about Burke Airport is that it is a long stretch where again, you can't get out. So you really have to know where those access points are um, because in an emergency, it's just the airport. You're not able to get out. But the cool thing about Burke Airport is one of my favorite things to do when I'm paddling is paddle over to the end of the runway and just sit there and look up and watch all of the planes fly overhead. Um, it's super, super cool. So if you have time, paddle out North Coast Harbor, check out the Mather, and then watch the planes fl oh, fly over your head and then paddle back. On the other side, uh, you also have the break wall. So you saw a quick picture, we moved on, but you saw a quick picture there of the break wall. And if you're not familiar with the break wall, uh, that it's gonna basically be concrete pillars that are out there. All right, so then East 55th, I finally had some lunch. Uh, so this is about 1.30 in the afternoon. I had my husband meet me and we grabbed some lunch. So a great paddle is to be able to stop at East 55th or Edgewater or different places to be able to get some food. And you will notice in this picture here, yes, like anybody who's paddled a lot, I had dessert first. So key lime pie went down first before I got some other food in me. Uh, it was absolutely delicious. And so after lunch, I got back on the water. And the cool thing about East 55th is we've actually, Clean Metro Parks has received a grant. So we're working on putting an adaptive kayak uh, launch pad in this area. So in the future, people are going to be able to launch and be able to paddle in this area. All right, so now that I've had lunch, about 16 miles, I was debating, am I, am I gonna make it the whole way? I was feeling great at that time. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna make it. And I will say, you always have to have plan A, plan B, and plan C. So my plan A was to make it. My plan B was, my husband works downtown. If I don't make it, pick me up however far I get. And then plan C is, you need to take me up now. Something's not going right. So always have those emergencies. File that float plan to be able to stay safe out there. All right, so Gordon Park, we're leaving that Cleveland skyline. You have East 72nd, which is Gordon Park, where you can go ahead and get on. It's at the end of the break wall. So now you're in open water again. 
And as we move on from Gordon Park, you're going to start to see uh, the east side. So the difference from the east side paddling is that you don't have those towering cliffs that we had on the west side, but now there's a lot of private property. So you still have to know where all of those access points are. You can see the water's gotten a little bit flatter again. Things are good, and I actually have the wind on my back, so I'm able to go a lot faster. As I continue to be able to head to the uh, to the east, uh, we came to Bratnaw, and this was something that Ashley and I discovered while we were out paddling. Uh, there's not a lot of tall buildings there, but when you see this tall one, you can actually see that there's a little cove that you can paddle up. So if Lake Erie starts to get windy, you can kind of take safety in here. There's tons of koi, carp. It's a really cool paddle just to be able to check out while you're back there. All right, as we go east, Wildwood Park is the next one we're going to see. And here I want to talk about boater's eye. So when you're paddling for a distance, at the beginning when I was on the west side, I stayed close to shore. As I got a little tired, I was like, there's no reason for me to paddle really close to shore. I can see where I'm headed and I'm going there. Um, but as you're further away from the shore, now things look a lot smaller. So you have to use boater's eye to be able to pick structures to see where you're at the whole time. Um, so big towers that stick up. Here we have Euclid Beach. Um, so big sand swaths will tell you what it is. So have things, look at Google Earth to be able to see what you'll see while you're out there paddling. So I knew when I got to Wildwood Park, I could make it from there. It's only another five miles. Uh, so I continued on to Sims Park to be able to reach that end destination. So I got there at 6.45, so it took me around 11 hours to be able to paddle it. Um, I was actually excited. I wasn't completely dead, but trust me, I was tired. Uh, that was the longest paddle, and I'd never been so happy to see Sims Park. Uh, but from there, I hope you can take your own fun micro adventures with you. So to help you plan your micro adventures, I want to talk a little bit about the safety equipment that you should take with you. So this is a day trip. So any day trip that you go on, uh, this is really all the stuff you should take. You should never just grab your board, life jacket, and paddle and be like, I'm going out. Um, always make sure you take this stuff because you never know what can happen. Even on the 90 plus degree day that it was when I was paddling in July, I had different layers because when you're out on the water, the water can make you cold. So have layers for sun protection, for warmth, a first aid kit, sunscreen, snacks, plenty of water. Uh, you can see here the you can see the bike uh, lock that I brought just in case I had to lock up my board, extra power supplies. Um, but in addition to that, I want to talk about some stuff for primarily paddling on open water in Lake Erie. So you want to make sure you have that VHF radio to be able to take with you. It's going to make sure you are connected in case you have an emergency so you know where freighters are. You're also going to make sure that you have your cell phone, that you can track them uh, through marinetraffic.com while you're out there. You might bring a glow stick or a headlamp just in case it gets dark when you're out there. And the big thing is you want to bring some type of safety equipment. So we always carry a distress flag just in case, oh no, something is happening. I can hold this up and get other people's attention. Um, and also probably a signal flare. Uh, so a flare just in case you get stranded, you need to put it off. If a power boat is coming pretty fast towards you, you can put it off, obviously not at them, but up in the sky so that they can see that you're there. So different pieces and parts in open water, Lake Erie paddling that you should definitely um, take with you. All right, so as we continue on, a couple more tips for you guys uh, if you're paddling your own adventures. You wanna make sure you check the four W's. That's the weather, wind, waves, and water. So are there any storms approaching? The day I was paddling, there was a storm to the south. So when I was having lunch at East 55th, I was monitoring it, saw it was staying south so I could continue. If it wasn't, I'd have to end my trip, and that's just how it is. Check the wind. Again, I started with the south and then it went west. It was helping me. That's why I went west to east. If it was an east wind, I would have switched directions. You want to use the wind to your advantage. Check the wave height. Make sure the waves aren't bigger than you can handle. And then check the water, the water quality and the water temperature um, when you are out there paddling. And you can find more information on the paddling brochures uh, that will be available later. All right, as we continue on, uh, we're going to see these are some apps that we use to be able to check those weather conditions. So one of my favorite is going to be on the left here. It's the near shore forecast. And when you guys came into the presentation, we threw a link up there. But if you search Great Lakes near shore forecast, it's going to be a great way for you to be able to see it. And then you can click the certain area. It's going to tell you wind wave conditions. Different um, uh, so the Cleveland Intake Crib that we paddle to has its own weather monitoring system. 
so you can get additional things there. And then there's actually a beach cam out at Edgewater on the Cleveland Metro Park site, so you can see surfers out there, you can see what the conditions are, see if it's a good day to be able to get out there and paddle. All right, so the other thing to keep in mind is we want to make sure that you stay safe. This is the signage that will be going up as part of the Lake Erie Water Trail. You want to ask yourself, are you Lake Erie ready? Do you have the skills? Do you have the equipment? Do you have the safety knowledge? Are you able to get yourself back into a boat if you flip over? If you're thinking, gosh, never thought about it, my boat flipped over, I don't know what I would do. Take a class with us. Um, when we're able to offer classes again this summer. We want you to be really prepared for whatever happens to you because when you're paddling on big water, anything can happen. And then we'll put, you'll see some of this additional sign coming up in the future. All right, so a couple more things to talk about here before we switch it over to Ashley. So I've talked about a lot of these paddling adventures. I'm gonna step out in case you wanna um, do a screenshot or anything of this. These are some good micro adventures that we recommend for people if you're getting out on Lake Erie. Of course, a flat water place that Ashley's gonna talk about is going to be a little bit better um, if you're just getting started, but when it's a calm day, these are great places for you to have your own fun micro adventures to really get out and be able to explore. All right, so hopefully you got that screenshot. Uh, we're gonna pop on to the next one here. All right, and so this is Ashley's son. And so he has gone on many micro adventures. You're gonna hear more stories about him. Uh, but when we were, at, we paddled over to East 55th, we found some mulberries. So you can continue to connect with nature and have fun while you are out there. So with this, if you have any other Lake Erie water trail questions, go ahead and type them in and we can go ahead and answer them for you. Uh, but we're gonna go ahead and, and transition with Ashley's son. She's gonna tell us more about the Allegheny River water trail. So I'll still be here if you have questions. We're just gonna do a little switch uh, as we continue on. So any Lake Erie water questions, go ahead and add them here and we will grab them as Ashley gets ready to transition to the Lake Erie Water Trail. Uh, all right, Ashley, before you get started, we have a quick question. What water temperature is safe for Lake Erie paddlers? Um, so, do you, do you want to take that one? Sure, that's a, that's a big, it depends type, sort of question. So, the answer really is, what sort of equipment do you have to keep yourself prepared and safe while paddling. So if the answer is a dry suit, you can paddle in most conditions except for when it's frozen over. If the answer is a really, really, really thick wetsuit, I would say the answer is, a, is similar. If you have just a thin wetsuit, then you're gonna to wanna to be getting out around 40, 50 degrees. Air temperature plays into that as well. And then if the answer is I'm out in regular clothes and a life jacket, then you're gonna be wanting to quit around those 40 degree temperatures, 50, or 40, 50, 60 degree temperatures. So it really depends on the air and water. You can combine those two to get a total temperature. And if it's below 120 degrees, so your air or water temperature is below 120, then you really wanna think about adding some of those extra layers like wetsuits or dry suits. Hopefully that answers your question. That is a really great one, so thank you. And thank you, Rachel, for telling us about your amazing adventure on the Lake Erie Water Trail. It is an awesome place, Lake Erie, to paddle. There are lots of other adventures uh, that you can take there as well, so keep exploring. So we're gonna transition to an overnight endeavor that we took, Rachel being we, and my family, my husband and son, so you'll see them in those pictures as well. And so this trail, as we continue on, you'll see is actually in Pennsylvania, in Northwest Pennsylvania, you can see it's the very top corner. It begins at Kinzu Dam on the uh, New York, Pennsylvania border, and it travels all the way to the I-80 bridge. I'm sure most of you have been on I-80 at some point in time. The Allegheny River passes under, and that portion is called the Middle Allegheny River Water Trail, and it is 107 river miles long so it is big you can see that on that left side of the screen that whole section of those maps is just the middle allegheny river and what makes it such a great place to paddle is that it is designated wild and scenic so you're in a lot of forested area 
And it also has a designation of recreation status, which means that it's highly accessible. So for beginner paddlers, newer paddlers to doing overnights, it is a great place to get your start. The other thing that I love about this river is that in 1984, seven of the islands that dot the river were designated as wilderness islands to help preserve the unique riverine forests of those islands. And what's great about it is that they're beautiful, but it also great, creates a great primitive camping location as you're paddling. So that's what we're gonna use as we paddle. And you can see, as we progress to the next slide, you can see a general layout about our trip. So map is hard to see, but you'll see that we started in Starbrick, which is 12 river miles downstream of Kinzu. So we pretty much started at the top of the trail, middle river water trail, and we were late in getting there, right? This was a trip smack in between two work weeks. And so it was really just kind of a weekend overnight endeavor. Uh, and so that's what's great about it. It's close, it's like three hours away. So you can get out there in a half a day pretty quickly, arrange your shuttle because you cannot paddle up and down the river easily. So make sure you have two vehicles to arrange that shuttle. And so we were really just hopping on the water about four o'clock. And remember, we've got a pretty little guy with us. Uh, so we paddled and the goal was just to paddle a little bit till we got tired and started into some of those wilderness islands. So we were only on the river for four miles that day till about seven o'clock. And then we stopped at Crawls Island. Yeah, Crawls, not Skulls, right? Uh, it is 96 acres. So to give you an idea, anybody know how many acres a football field is? I'll give you some chance to answer that question. But we stayed on Crawls. It is a rather large island compared to a lot of the other ones. And then the next day was our big paddling day. So we're gonna pop on over to the next slide and you'll get to see that. And we were not hustling by any means. We weren't getting out of camp early. We weren't paddling quickly and we took our time getting into camp and had lots of time there. So that day was 12 miles that we paddled. And then we paddled to Corson's Island, uh, which is just out of Tidiut, um, the little town. There is a restaurant you can stop and check out. And we stayed on that island. It is smaller, more like 60 acres. So not as big, but still absolutely gorgeous. And then our final day, we stayed, paddled 10 miles to our takeout so that we could get Rachel back to her car at the top of the river, right? And then drive home. And it, it's a very realistic uh, two night trip that you can do, or you can make it longer, or you can just do one night. And that's the great thing about this trail is that it is very highly accessible. All right, Ashley, we have a guess of, Henry says 140, Wendy Miller says 1.3 acres. How many acres in a football field? Wow, Wendy, did you look that up on Google? You are exactly right, it's just over one and a quarter acres. So imagine 96 acres this island is, it's big. So that's a lot of football fields. So this trip is or this slideshow is a little bit about how we planned our trip and a little bit of the pictures and things we thought about so that you can start planning your trip on the Allegheny River. So one thing you want to find really quickly when you're planning trips are some trip planning aids and this one that's up here is a great one you do have to pay for it but the benefit is that it's laminated pages so you can put it in your kayak or on your board and take it with you and it gives you kind of an hour by hour breakdown of each of those locations. And there's some history and nature pieces that you're gonna see along the way. So it's a great, great resource. Uh, there's another one website that Rachel is gonna put in the chat bar for you because she is now manning the computer or personing the computer. And it is just a website, but it has a lot of information including where you can and cannot camp. So those are things that you need to think about because we are traveling through on this river through national forests, state forests, county forests, as well as state game lands. And so you can camp in some of those locations and not in all. And so this website and these trip planning aids will let you know that. So make sure you know, lots of good information. All right, so things to think about as you're planning the trip and things that we were thinking about as we kind of built the parameters for this trip. What is your time frame? We were cramming this into a weekend, 
So naturally, that's going to determine how many miles we can paddle. The other thing to factor in is who are you paddling with and who are their goals, right? We, we planned in a lot of time for rock skipping, hopping out of the boat, swimming, taking snack gummy breaks because we did have Henry, my son, with us, who is 10. This was his first overnight paddling experience. He has been paddling for a while, so we knew he could do it. Um, but we did kind of plan that into our schedule and into our miles for the day, for each day. If it's a bunch of experienced paddlers, you're going to want to up that mileage. So just to give you an idea, for this river, you can pretty easily paddle two to three miles an hour. Very relaxed with hardly a lot of paddling. So just kind of as a baseline for you all. And then finally, resources are going to help to define that those parameters. So the resources are things like your campsites. How like is there an island near where you're going to want to stop? Do you, are you going to have to do less or more miles to hit those islands that you're going to need to camp on? You can camp on some of the river edges as well. You just need to pay attention as well to what type of land that is. So the final thing we want to consider on our next slide is where are you getting your water? So water is a thirsty business or paddling is a thirsty business because there is no shade where you're paddling the sun is beating down on you the whole time and the sun rays are reflecting off the water so you get really thirsty you've got to carry enough water there's a couple things that i like to do i have a hydration bladder that will fit in and i know this is yellow so it's not white and clear but it is yellow and black it fits in and integrates with my life jacket so that I have it available and I don't have to pull it out of any hatches. So that's one thing that I do to make sure that I'm drinking all day. Another is to stock water bottles. Just a quick guess, how heavy is this one liter water bottle? Any guesses? So as you're paddling, it's going to be really, really hard to carry all of the water that you're going to need for an entire trip, especially if it's three days or longer. So you're going to have to find water somewhere, which means you're purifying in some way. And so we did filter our water using a pump filter, just like this one. We did carry an additional backup, which you should always do. This is Aquamura. It's a chemical purifier and so when some basic thoughts when you're purifying is that the more the bigger the source that means the more that's dumping in from the watershed right so the idea is to think smaller as far as purifying water so if you can get into those tributaries you're going to be better off with cleaner water and so when we planned our trip we were looking for at least two sources tributaries where we knew there was water going to be running each day and so that also went into that factor of planning water. And you can see on the top left a little bit, that's a view of those tributaries that you can just see from a kayak. And then the next picture to the right is us kind of climbing up and scouting and walking upstream to find that small source and to see what it looks like. And then you can see my husband Skip getting his water out of his kayak at the end of the day. So every morning before we took off, we looked at our maps we decided based on how much water we use for dinner and breakfast that morning, and I like my coffee, so I need to have water. And then we decided where we were gonna stop based off of that and how many times we we're gonna filter. We didn't filter any more than two times per day. And you can carry extra water and things like dromedaries that will help you have a bigger water capacity. Sorry, Ashley, you asked how heavy is a liter. We had two pounds, one pound, and 2.2 plus the bottle. Yeah, that's that's an excellent answer. So 2.2 is right. Uh, it is just under two and a half pounds. That's the way I like to remember it. 2.2 is super accurate. And so just imagine you should be drinking about three liters at the least, right, as you're paddling. So that's a lot. That weight adds up. Kayaks are amazing. Boards are a little harder, but kayaks can carry a lot. But I like to use my carrying capacity for comfy things like coffee and awesome food, meals, and things like that. So I choose to purify as opposed to trying to carry more water. So as we move on, 
you can see that there are many different types of paddling experiences just where we were, which we, we covered less than 30 miles if you added all that up. And you can see on our top right, it's a very flat venue there, just, le just a little quicker than paddling on an inland lake. So there is a current, but it is slow. So it's very much like paddling on an inland lake. And then towards the middle there, you can see that it is shallow and that there is some current. And you might even, if you really, really look closely, see Rachel in the back behind Henry there, walking her stand-up paddleboard because she has to be different from all of us. And beyond that stand-up oh, paddleboard, <laughs> she has a fin that is deeper than the hull of the kayak. And so she was not able to skirt through some of those more shallow areas and had to walk some of it. So just make sure that there is enough water in the river that you're not walking a huge amount of it. And the Allegheny is good for most seasons because it is a bigger river, so you don't run in that, into that very often. And I don't think I mentioned before, but we did this about mid-July, kind of in the heat of the summer. So there's not many times you're gonna have to walk, and we did not walk often. And then in our far left, whoop, uh, you can see that there is some riffles and rapids, and my son was hooting and hollering the whole time, and there's just enough of them that it keeps it super exciting. There's nothing big by any means, and there's definitely nothing in the way of those rapids, so you can just ride right through them. But it definitely makes it super exciting. So how can you find out how much water is in the river? Well, USGS water gauges are the place that you're going to want to do that. You can see the link is right on the bottom of the slide. This chart you'll see is in feet height. So, and this is actually for February of this year because I just did it. But you can also see charts on that same website that are in CFS or cubic feet per second. So the max, the top end that you'll ever want to run this, and this would only be if you're a really good paddler, uh, is 5,000 coming out of Kinzu Dam, right? And so what you are seeing is nothing close to that in these conditions. We were much, 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 much lower. I don't actually know, remember what it was at that point in time, um, but it is nothing near that. So make sure that you know and that there's enough water that you're not walking. And you can check out water gauges for multiple places along the river to get a better accurate idea based on where you're hopping in and out. So as we move on, the last thing to think about is planning times in that trip to take advantage of these amazing moments like coming up on rocks that you can see. Like we couldn't jump off of them, but we were able to hop out. They're super tall, we hiked around, we explored, we looked over the edges and we took a lunch break. And then on our far left, you can see the bridge, which is really pretty, and we got to look at that for a while, but also is a landmark. So this trail is all through a lot of forested areas. So it's very difficult sometimes to track where you are along this water trail as you move downstream. And so each morning, you're gonna to wanna to pull those maps out and those resources and you're going to want to make a checklist of those landmarks that you're going to see so that as you pass them, you can know where you are so you're not missing your water sources or your campsite or, my goodness, your takeout, right? Because that would be terrible. So just something to consider along your way while you're having all that fun. Okay, moving on. We're almost there. Rachel made a very in-depth packing list. If you can't see it and you're interested, let us know. We can send this to you via email. Uh, but this is an, a list of everything she brought and ordered by dry bag. And you can see how she packed it on her stand-up paddleboard. And a couple things, I'm not gonna go through everything, but a couple things to think about is that gray box is her clear see-through bag. And that one you can kind of see on her paddleboard is within easy reach. Those are the things that are emergency items, high need things while you're on the river that you can access quickly and not have to dig through. I also want to state that it is different to pack on a stand-up paddleboard. You're more thinking about condensing things into different dry bags and getting them latched securely, whereas in a kayak, you're thinking about getting them all in your hatches that are about yay big. This is a front hatch of my kayak. Some of your back hatches are gonna be this big, uh, but some are bigger. But think in multiple small dry bags. So don't think big dry bags in this case. Think about having small dry bags 
and having lots of them and packing the little nooks and crannies that your hatches create. So my other suggestion is pack, pack, pack ahead, try it over and over again and make sure you can fit everything that you want. The great thing again about kayaks and paddling and not backpacking is that you can carry some yummy food with you and take some extra weight because you're just paddling it down river and you're not carrying it on your back. So again, don't hesitate to ask questions. The last thing is find fun in the experience. So plan time to have fun, but plan time for those unexpected experiences like coming up on rocks that are amazing or stopping to take pictures of this really cool piece of wildlife you saw because there is lots of wildlife on this trail. And even if it's raining, which might happen, I like to call that type two fun, it might not be fun while you have it. If you can find the fun in that, amazing. You're wet anyways, right? Uh, but find fun in that experience as well. So we're gonna move on to creating some next steps for your next adventure. After we've presented a couple water trail options, we're gonna give you just a quick couple options to do some other things locally. So if you're new to paddling, an inland lake might be for you. So Hinkley, Wallace are very close to Clevelanders and Cuyahoga County. If you want to go a little east, Ladue Reservoir is bigger. It is beautiful. You can paddle that and check it out. And if you live a little south or you just want to paddle something different, Portage Lakes and Nimicilla is connected to it. It is another really great inland lake you can paddle. And a couple weeks in August, Purple Martins fly through. You can see in that kind of like middle picture right there with the sunset all those black little dots those are purple martins and they swarm the sky and land in the marshes that are sitting there and it is amazing so i i say check it out at some point in time so if you want more of an allegheny river water trail you can check out the cuyahoga river water trail which rachel talked about a little bit but it is newly designated it does dump into lake erie you can see that it's u-shaped it's about 100 miles long it starts to the east near Ladue and then Burton, and then it travels down through Kent, makes the bend through Akron, and then heads back towards Cleveland to dump into the lake. And as you'll see on the next slide, the amazing thing about the Cuyahoga River is that there is a lot of different paddling experiences that you can have on this river. If you go to the upper Cuyahoga, it's great for families, beginner paddlers, because it is so flat, you can paddle both up and down the river. It is also a wild and scenic designated, so it is beautiful with lots and lots of wildlife that you can see. As you move down river, you'll see that the Kent section and even the Cuyahoga Valley section, they have rapids, uh, but there are lots of rentals there that are available for you. If you're in the Cuyahoga Valley National Parks section, you can hop on the train and it will take your kayak as well as a way to shuttle, which is super cool. And then the one section only experienced whitewater paddlers should paddle is the gorge, and that is in Cuyahoga Falls, where the Sheraton Hotel is kind of right on the bend of the Cuyahoga River. So lots of places to check out. As we move forward, you will see some another way to check water levels, and this is American Whitewater website. You can see that it is very color coded, meaning that red is not runnable, green is runnable, blue is too high to run. That does not speak to the class. So if you look closely or you check it out for yourself, you'll see that there's class listings that li is listed by difficulty. So one and two, more beginner, three, five, experienced whitewaters, and so on. And just because it says it's runnable and it's in your class doesn't mean that it's still runnable for you. You have to know your experience level as more water is moving through that system, uh, the, the rapids in the water gets bigger and faster. So I say, when in doubt, get out and scout. And I say, always scout prior to. So check out the water before you hop in. If it's too fast for you, don't get in the water. Final thoughts before we hop out, because we're running out of time, is create the time to do these micro adventures. We've given you a lot of options, even if it's an hour or two that you have, a day like Rachel had, or just that weekend, you can still get out and experience amazing things. So check it out. Before you do it, know that Northeast Ohio is an amazing place to paddle. We have open water venue like Lake Erie. We have rivers that are amazing with multiple types of options for different levels of experience. And we have inland lakes, which are great too. 
And so as you progress through those different types of water, make sure you have the knowledge and skills for that venue and the safety equipment for that venue. And then finally, have a plan and a backup plan. Uh, know where you're getting in, know where you're getting out, tell a friend and make sure that, or a loved one, and make sure that they'll hold you accountable. So if you don't hop out and you're not back when you say you should, they're gonna help you out and contact the proper authorities. And then if you have a bad experience, get some education and come back. Don't give up because again, Northeast Ohio is an amazing place to paddle as well as Pennsylvania. And so you'll see on our next slide, you can find some classes through Outdoor Recreation, Cleveland Metro Parks. You can see a schematic of how our programs are run. You can start with a kayak, try it, or stand up paddleboard, try it, or a canoe, try it, which is entry level, great for families, very low cost to just get in and experience it. Those kayak ones and twos are like a learn it where you can learn the skills like rescues, strokes, things like that, that will help you uh, paddle efficiently. And then you can do our experience at level that are tours or trips. And so then there's more learn it experiences like coastal kayaking, which would be kayaking in narrower sea kayaks on Lake Erie. So there is a ginormous breadth of classes that you can take with us and with outfitters locally. So make sure you get out and get that education. And this is the end of our presentation. We will hang out for the next 15, 10 minutes. If you have questions, Rachel and I are here. So please, please ask. I'm gonna hop off the stage, uh, but we will be here. So thank you for joining. Take the spring and early summer to plan those paddles now and then get out and be, ex be excited as we are. So we had a really great question. I'm just gonna answer it in person. It was how I'm interested in buying a kayak. How do you know the pros and cons? And so one thing I would highly recommend is getting a class, uh, especially if you come to one of our programs, you can try a diff couple different types of kayaks. But what I would say is the first thing uh, that you need to think about is what type of paddling do you want to do? So there are different types of kayaks like whitewater-esque, which uh, go down rivers really well, but they, and they turn really well, but they do not paddle in a straight line at all. And so you don't really want to paddle flat water and definitely not on Lake Erie with whitewater kayaks. And then kind of moving along in size, you're gonna run into your recreation-based kayaks, which is most of what you're gonna see in the area. And those are anywhere from like 10 foot to 13-ish foot. And those are going to be good for really calm days on Lake Erie only. Uh, they could do slow rivers, kind of like the Allegheny River that we were on, or parts of the Cuyahoga, and they can do flat water just fine. Those boats are going to look wider and flatter, and that's generally how you can tell that it's a recreation-based kayak. What I will say, I was talking about um, hatches is that recreation kayaks have less of these, meaning they don't have that internal wall or bulkhead. Having bulkheads are important because if you do capsize or flip your kayak over on accident, right, it's going to fill with water in that cockpit unless you're on a sit on top kayak, which is the exception. And that partition section is an airspace that helps to float your kayak and not fill with water. So the more bulkheads you have, and hatches usually are an indicator that there is a bulkhead. You should always check it out first though to make sure that that is the case. But those are indicators that you have bulkheads and the more bulkheads you have, the better your boat is going to float. So sea kayaks that are really long have multiple. For instance, my 17 foot, ki or foot kayak has four uh, hatches or bulkheads so two of them are super small uh, in it. Where a recreation kayak, you can get two if you're really lucky, one generally, and sometimes none. So make sure that you're buying one with a bulkhead. If you don't, you can buy things called uh, float bags and you can stick them in um, and fill them up and they'll take the space of that hatch. Uh, so that's your recreation kayak. And then once you get into the 14, foot you're moving into a 
touring slash sea kayak. Uh, kind of starts in that 15, 16 and longer. And those are great for going straight, uh, hitting wind and waves. And so they are really good for Lake Erie and places like that. They could handle the Allegheny, but they're not gonna do that well. So you really gotta know what you want. A 14 foot kayak uh, is the size of the kayak I was paddling in a lot of those pictures on the river, not in the Lake Erie ones. That was my 17 foot kayak, but a 14 foot is a pretty good all around size kayak that you might consider. So you just really gotta know what you want and what you're interested in doing and um, no kayak does everything super well, which is why my husband wants to kill me all the time because I always want to buy new kayaks because there's never enough. So uh, find one that is a good all around for something that you think you're going to be interested in, and then you can always buy more.